Bella roll them dice. You never know if it could change your life. Take a chance, you need the wrong or right. You never know if you don't roll them dice. You better roll them dice. You never know if it could change your life. One, two. Take a chance. Ro- you need uh, Rob, Rob, I, I really want to be, I want to be a game master, Rob. But I don't know what to do. I have this problem. So, so you want to be a game master, is what you're telling I me. I want to be a game master. So you, you want to be, be a game master. We well, both want to be game masters. That's that's challenging, or it would be under normal circumstances. But uh, I, I think I think that maybe we've got somebody who can help us with this. Hello, everyone. This is Dungeon Master of None. I'm Dungeon Master Rob. I'm Dungeon Master Matt, and we're joined today by Justin Alexander, author. Playwright, stage actor, game designer, credits on dozens of RPG supplements, and an author on the Infinity role-playing game for Modiphius and Magical Kittens Save the Day for Atlas Games, where he produces their RPG department. He blogs about TTRPGs at thealexandrian.net. Justin, author of the new book, So You Want to Be a Game Master. Welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's always great to be here. Uh, it's happier, happier days to be talking with you than uh, the last time you were on the show. Where we were talking about the OGL debacle. Yes, thankfully, uh, it, it's it's amazing to me that it was only a few months ago because it it ended so well that it feels like it was a long time ago, which is actually a lovely outcome. From it, that. it, fe- it feels like an, an, an eternity. I, everybody has moved on, which is great because I was very tired of talking about it. So I, it's just so <laughs> it's so nice to. To yeah, have that in the rear view and mostly satisfactorily resolved and yeah, be able to talk about more exciting things like upcoming books. Indeed, and I have one of those. Rob and I have followed your blog and your uh, game mastering uh, philosophy for years. We've talked about so many of your your things on the show. I, I, in fact, uh, not to like get all edition wars, but like <laughs> the thing I think I first read of yours was, uh, someone had linked to one of your articles on, on, uh, some of the fourth edition design and why it rubs certain people like myself the wrong way. The, 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 the sort of spherical cows and, and whatnot. <laughs> but <laughs> what I, I, I kept clicking around and the first thing I came to is like your 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 stuff on on railroading and and prepping situations over plots. I was wondering if you could tell us like how you develop this philosophy and, and, and sort of what it is, the the situation, the rejection of plot philosophy. Yeah, one of the earliest articles I wrote for the Alexandrian was was literally called Don't Prep Plots. And it had a maxim in it, which is don't prep plots, prep situations. And the basic idea is that in this case, we're defining plot here as a predetermined sequence of events, the way that you plot a novel or a comic book or a film. So like A happens, then B happens, and then C happens. And you can really see this really clearly in published modules, for example. Uh, You can tell they're prepping a plot when the module talks about what the PCs are going to do. So you'll see phrases like, and then the PCs will do this, and then the PCs will do this. And those predetermined sequences of events, these predetermined activities that the PCs are going to do, are really antithetical to what role-playing games are really all about and the unique strengths that role-playing games as a medium bring to the table, pun intended, um, (laughs) in in the sense that role-playing games are specifically there to be an interactive medium. That in many ways you can actually think of a role-playing game as almost being defined by the relationship between the players and the game master. That the fact that there is a game master or a referee at the table allows the players to play characters who can do anything. And if you can do anything, then you shouldn't be predetermining what that list of things is that the players can do. And that can be tricky to handle because every other medium that we're familiar with, again, comic books, films, TV shows, all of it, all of that is linear mediums where the writer predetermines everything because they're pre-writing everything before you before you partake of, of the art, right? But in a role-playing game, you need to find a different way of preparing the material that you're going to run at the table. And... There's a couple of reasons for that. I mean, the first reason is like it's just a good idea because that's, again, what role-playing games are really good at. The second reason is that those kinds of predetermined plots 
that can turn into railroads very easily tend to be very fragile structures. Because if you think about that structure of A happens, then B happens, or C happens, or the players have to do A, the players have to do B, the players have to do C, that's what I think of as a very fragile scenario structure. Because if the players don't do A, suddenly you're in a heap of trouble because now everything falls apart. And if they don't do B, everything falls apart. And so you have this whole chain of very fragile things that are very difficult to sort of like force to have happen. So the flip side of this is that you can prep things in situations. And one of the ways I really think about that is that it's really about prepping things as a game master that you can actively play with at the table. And sometimes I think of them as toys and sometimes I think of them as, as tools that you can use. But what you want are these things that, that you can actively play with the players. So like the players tell you that they want to do something and you're like, ooh, what toy can I use to play with them? And do that. And then the cool thing is that realistically, that's what the players are doing too, because you pick up your toys and you tell them what the toys are doing. And then the players actively play in response to that. And once everyone at the table is actively playing with each other, that's both exciting, in my experience, for everyone involved, you and the players. And also, none of you really know where that game's going to go, which is also exciting. And then on top of all of that, collaboratively, I find that the, the places you'll go and the things that you'll create in that, in that active play environment are often way cooler than anything that you could have prepped ahead of time. I, I think one of the things you said, I, I agree with all of that, but I think it's, it's a mistake and it's a trap that a lot of newbie GMs fall into, you know, not realizing, like you said, how fragile plots are like, uh, and you know, if you think about any story worth telling or anyone that you like, they're all built on an, you know, an edifice of coincidence and chance and, you know, very, uh, like, unlikely events. That's what makes them good stories. Like, imagine imagine that you needed your players to go to the Jawas and buy the exact right astromech droid to, like, start the plot <laughs> and just, like, expecting them to do that without, like, you know, you, you know, uh, placing your hand on the scale. Like, that's the kind of thing... That if you go into a campaign or a game, like expecting, expecting to tell a story, right, the way that you might uh, direct a movie or write a novel, uh, again, it's it's an easy mistake to make. But I, I think we're so used to those mediums that we don't realize how much how much of it is contrived in a good way, like how much it is constructed by the the storyteller, and that you have an entirely different job as a as a as a game master. It's absolutely trivial for a novelist or a screenwriter to guarantee that something will happen. Like one of the one of the scenario structures I talk about, and so you want to be a game master, is how to design a mystery scenario for your players. And this is a great example because, like, if you're an author writing an, a detective novel, or um, or you're Ryan Johnson doing Knives Out, you can guarantee that that the detective will find a particular clue, no matter how well that clue is hidden. Or obscured, or how, or how large a leap of logic needs to be taken to reach a particular conclusion off of that one clue. You can guarantee that Sherlock Holmes will make that discovery and make that deduction. But if you're designing a mystery for a role-playing game, you have no way of guaranteeing that the players will look for that clue to begin with. Like they may just be like, "Oh, there's no clues here," and just walk away and be like, "But all the clues are here. Please help." <laughs> um, so they may not look for it. If they find it, they may not realize the significance of it. Um, and even if they do realize it's a clue, they may still make the wrong deduction. Like they may be like, "Oh, hey, uh, I found these these gum wrappers. That must mean we need to go stake out the local gum manufacturing plant." You're like, "No, it's it's a clue to the guy who is chewing gum." In the last scene, how do you not? <laughs> right. How do you not see that? Um, so, like you know, those are the, those are the dangers of of prepping a mystery as you would write a mystery novel, for example. And so the 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 key to that is is what I call the the three clue rule, where for any uh, for any conclusion that you want the players to make in a mystery scenario, you should include at least three clues pointing to that conclusion. Uh, it's a very simple rule, but it creates a much more... Like we talked about how the A, then B, then C is a very fragile structure. The three-clue rule is very effective at making a very robust structure that, in my experience, results in mysteries that actually successfully conclude without you know giving you an ulcer. Right. It, it also, like, uh, allows you to kind of start prepping in a, in a robust way. If you think of the three-clue rule as a, a tripod supporting each node 
And if your players are going from uh, scene to scene, you can kind of always plan, you know, one or two nodes out of, of what's happening and link each of those by, by clues going from more than one node. So you have kind of a, a dense web of places for your players to go and, and things that could uh, happen. What, one, one thing that I really like about your approach to game mastering is, and, and tell me if I'm getting this right, is it's, it's more about treating, instead of uh, treating the game master as an author, right? It's treating the game master as another artist at the table that is just sort of using a different uh, set, of, set of tools, Right. I was, is that sort of your underlying philosophy? Am I that that's a hundred percent right? Yeah, that's a hundred percent right. I mean, it, and it, and this is actually something too that that I see, I see, I see designers fall into this trap of thinking, well, this is really, really hard. And sometimes you'll see designers of like introductory role playing adventures, for example, be like, well, I, I had to write it as a railroad because it, it's too difficult to do anything else. And I actually take the exact opposite belief as as a designer, which is that these railroads, these linear plots that you force players to take certain actions along, and to be clear, I want, I want to clarify one thing, not all linear adventures are railroads, but plots are railroads. You have to force the players to do those actions, right? Or they very easily become railroads. So these 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 high linear plotted or railroaded adventures, the the problem they're, they're very fragile. But and and because they're fragile, they're actually very difficult to run. That that linearity gives an illusion of simplicity and ease, which in practice is very difficult because you have to you have to guarantee that whole sequence of outcomes. And having to guarantee an outcome as a GM is actually really complicated. It's why so many people who prep plots talk about players ruining their adventures. And sometimes people ask me, like, "Oh, when was the last time like the players ruined your adventure?" And I go. I don't know, like 20 years ago, because it's really difficult to, it's, it, it would be like going to Tom Brady and being like, hey, when did like the football ruin the game for you? Right. Like, that's just not the way games work, right? Like, you, oh, you played a board game? Like, how did, how did that board game get ruined for you? It's like, no, that's not really how board games work if they're, if they're well designed, right? So like, but, so I find that actually like, this active play mentality is a lot easier for the GM to get in, in on board with. But again, because of our familiarity with sort of linear stuff, people can be a little bit intimidated by it. But I point out that there's already someone at the table, that there's multiple people at the table who are already doing this, and it's the players. When the players show up for an RPG session, they have their character. They have they have the toy that they're going to play with, which is their character. They can control this character and do things with this character and play with this character. But no player comes to the table and is like, well, today I'm going to be doing A and then B and then C with my character. And like, I'm going to have to make sure that the whole table gets on board with A, then B, then C. That's just not how people play. And so they come to the table ready to actively engage with the other players and the GM at the table. And if the players can all do it, then the GM can do it. And also, in some ways, it's easier for the GM because the players only have the one toy to play with. You always have the option being like, let me go grab some more toys from the shelf. Like you've got an infinite <laughs> variety of toys that you can go grab and use at any time. Uh, that, that's another That's another great point. Uh, people ask me a lot too, like, you know, uh, how did your, like, when's the last time players ruined your game or how, like, what's the craziest thing that they did? And like, they definitely do things that I don't expect, like all the time, but it doesn't ruin the game because I, again, well... I expect them to do things that I don't expect. And so I like, we'll talk about like node based structure, but I just, you know, I'm like, okay, that's a, uh, again, speaking of leaps of logic, like they're, you know, they, they uh, draw a deduction that like, I can't even like wrap my head around, but I'm like, you know what? That's fine. We're, we're going with it. We're moving forward. I'm going to reskin some things. We're going to, you know, change the location and uh, it'll happen. But that takes, that does take like practice, right? It takes, experience and time because it's not necessarily intuitive but i i uh, i like your example of tom brady because this is a game right and it's a collaborative game and i think that uh, this may be anathema to a lot of uh role players but like i do think that it's helpful to think of it like uh like organized sports or like playing football or soccer or something like there's structure to it right you can't like you know go out of bounds you you know there's only certain ways to score like there's you know but like within that you can be incredibly creative but like it is a game and anything could happen right like it, you know uh somebody could hit a header and 
uh, score points, you know, uh, a pass get intercepted and then the play is entirely changed. But like, I think it's much better to think of your games, maybe as a combination, but closer to that than as a novel that you're, you know, you're trying to guide your players through. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and I, I really, I really do like you think of it in terms of organized sport because, you know, and, and as actually American football is interesting because sometimes you'll like American football coaches will like prescript the first plays of a game. And so there's nothing wrong with like thinking about, OK, well, this is what's likely going to happen and thinking along those lines. Right. Um, what you don't want to do, though, is get stuck into like being, well, I know it's first and 20 now. Um, but I scripted a, a five yard run play. So I guess we're going to have we're still going to do that. You know, we're still going to do, you know, you have to, you have to be flexible with the tools that you have available to you. So I, I, I love this and, and I don't want to nerd out about it too much, but this is exactly right. Right. Like coaches will go in with like a, with like a, this is what we expect the first 10 minutes, 20 minutes of play to look like. And sometimes, you know, you're playing against a predictable team. And it will it will follow that plan, and then like everybody's just sort of like executing the plan to the best of their ability, um, and it works out great. Uh, my experience is with like rugby in my past, and so like a lot of times, <laughs> you know, you'll have the first five ten minutes be very predictable between two good teams. But what makes a good coach, what makes a good team, is like when inevitably the like play plan breaks down, they can pivot and adapt and do something interesting with that. So like I, I think this is a, a particularly useful metaphor watch watch sports listeners it's it's good for you i promise <laughs> <laughs> well i think the way to kind of pivot that back towards role-playing games specifically is like one of the ways that you can improve uh as a as a game master is to is to learn the structures that you can use uh, i talk about i talk about uh scenario structures and i talk about campaign structures and I, and a lot of a lot of game masters and even rpg designers professional rpg designers uh, don't really understand the structures that they're using to build the scenarios that they have. And because they're limited in the structures that they have, and even unconscious of the structures that they're using, they become very limited and it can be very challenging for them to design and play the scenarios that they want to design and play. And that's a large part of what So You Want to Be a Game Master is about, is about uh, showing you the structures you can use to achieve the types of games you want to run. Yeah, that's a, a really interesting thought. I mean, I sometimes feel as a very experienced game master that when I'm running my games, I'm I, I sometimes stop and think like, am I actually doing anything to get better at this? Or am I kind of just doing the same thing I've been doing for like the last two decades? Um, and so I just sort of wonder in the book, like, is there any advice or do you have any advice for People who feel like they're, you know, they can handle running a game, uh, but they're not sure they know how to really level themselves up as a game master. Well, I think that there's kind of two parts to that. And and one of them is really deeply embedded in the structure of the book because it's really deeply embedded in my philosophy as a game master and as a designer. And that is practical step-by-step -step advice that you read a lot of game mastering advice and it is very high concept and there's nothing wrong with that it'll be things like oh here's how you can make like a really cool villain and you know what i have stuff about being a really cool villain in the extra credit section of the book but a lot of gming advice here's some cool stuff i'll, I'll leave it up to you to figure out how to bring it to the table and i am of the belief that there is in fact like a step-by-step -step process that a new game master can use and, and even experienced game masters can use to learn new things about what you prep and how you use that prep at the table that then results in adventure. And so, you know, that, that fear of leaving the structure of the linear plot, the A, then B, then C, can be alleviated by having more flexible play-based structures to use. And so that's, that is sort of the first part. It's like you need to actually get very concrete about what is the thing I'm doing that I want to improve on or the new thing that I want to learn. Like if you were like, hey, I want to learn math and like you just threw a bunch of numbers on the table, that's not how you learn math. To learn math, you have to be like, I'm going to study algebra today or I'm going to study geometry today, right? That that may be a terrible analogy, but hopefully in the ballpark of making sense. Right. Makes sense to me. Um, well, great, great, perfect. Then it's a fantastic analogy. Um <laughs> Well, then, I, I, sorry, I, I think, I think that's exactly uh, in the context, right? 
uh, you have to do practice problems, right? You have to like apply it to like learn math. And so you can learn role playing game concepts, but you have to you have to actually like, you know, put it into practice one way or another in order to to see. Well, sorry, this is actually maybe not a good example. I know there are some people who are very high concept about lots of things and they're like mathematicians who are like living in pure theory. I think for most people with most things that they are trying to learn, you have to like practically apply it to really learn it. That's how I learn everything. So I think that's a good principle. Well, and like actually the whole book is built around this. So like um, 20 pages into the book, uh, I say, okay, so we've learned a couple key things. Uh, you now have what you need to go run your first adventure. So I know it's a 540 page book, but you need to put this book down and you need to go and run your first adventure. And here's, and here's your first adventure. The book gives you your first adventure as well. But I say, you, you know, you've read 20 pages, you've learned enough to go run your adventure and you should go do that. You should go do that and then come back because the things you're going to learn actually putting this stuff into practice is absolutely vital. And so there's multiple places throughout the book where the book says, hey, great, you should go put this into practice now. It's not just about reading it and being like, that sounds like a good idea. You need to actually like go feel what it's like to do those things at the table. Matt, your, your question got me thinking, and I'm, I'm curious what Justin has to say, you know, when, when thinking about how to, how to level up or how to improve as a, as a game master, um, this is a big part of it. What I found myself doing to, to challenge myself and to, to try to get better to the extent that I'm thinking about that is to try to, to run games in different contexts and for different groups of people. So I, I've been trying to run more con games. I've been trying to run games for people who are not my like regular groups, uh, just to uh, stress test myself and my own like game mastering abilities. I, I, Justin, I, I'm not sure like what you think about that or like what your experience, you know, what sort of on the ground game mastering you're doing and, and like, sort of like how that, um, you know, how it hones your experience. I, I think that's a hundred percent true. I think that a lot of people end up just just playing a role playing game with the same five people um, month after month, year after year, and there's there's nothing wrong with that. To be a hundred percent clear, I have a D and D third edition game that I've been running for basically the same set of people since two thousand seven, and I love that game. I would not trade that game for anything. But I do play other games as well, and that's how I grow as a game master. And it also makes that game better to have those other experiences that get mixed into all of that. And I think, like you said, like playing con games is a great way to do that. You can also take the same philosophy and run short one shots for your existing group. The other thing in my own personal experience that greatly broadened my my gaming horizons was when I discovered um, what I call open tables. And an open table is just a different way of approaching how you think about how we run role-playing games. Because I think a lot of people, the current default for playing a role-playing game is being like, hey, these five or six people, let's all get together every week or every two weeks for the next six months or a year or two years or forever and play role-playing games together. And that's really cool. It's really powerful. There's a lot of really awesome things you can do with that kind of what I call dedicated table. But the drawback is that that is a huge ask when you want to start playing a game um, or to invite someone new to play with you. And to go back to our, our organized sports example, the, the example I often use is like playing baseball. If, if someone said, hey, what's baseball? I've never heard of it before. And you said, oh, it's really cool. You should try it. So we meet every Wednesday for practice and we play pick and we play games, league games on Saturday. So you should <laughs> sign up. We're going to be doing that for the next eight months. No one would try baseball, right? Like you'd have to be so interested in baseball to be like, yeah, I should give up multiple nights a week for the next eight months. But of course, that's not how people get involved in baseball. People get involved in baseball when somebody says, hey, you want to play catch? And playing catch is easy, right? Like you pick up a ball and you throw it back and forth. And some of the people who play catch will be like, I didn't like that. And they'll never play with a baseball again. But some people will be like, that's really cool. I, I saw a thing with a bat, though. Can we try the thing with the bat? And you'll be like, yeah, we can try that too. And eventually <laughs> eventually, some of those people will be enthusiastic enough to you know, join, join, a, join a neighborhood league or join the minor leagues or, or become an you know, MLB baseball player. And, and I mean, the people who don't do that will still have had good times playing catch um, or doing pickup back at batting practice or whatever um, at the local park. And that's good that they're having a good time. And so to bring this back to role playing games again, 
I just really want to talk about sports apparently today. <laughs> To bring this back to role playing games, like you can you can have similar experiences at the gaming table, and one of the ways you can do that is like the one shots. Like I just said, there's a lot of games that now that are actually pre designed with a pre built one shot, like um, John Harper's Lady Blackbird, for example, or Jeremy Keller's Tech Noir is another great game that can really play well. Is we're just gonna get together for one night and play games together, and when you can do it that way. You can approach role playing games the same way that you approach a board game, for example. And so if you just hang out with people, you can be like, hey, uh, should we play a board game? And they'll be like, yeah, you get to play a board game. But many people would never think to do that with a role playing game because they have this preconceived notion that role playing games are a multi week, super involved commitment. But I actually am able to be like, hey, do you guys want to like play some D&D tonight? And we can just sit down and play a one shot and have some fun with D&D or have some fun with Lady Blackbird or have some fun with Tech Noir. And, and you can do that. And when you have that ability, it both lets you play with a lot more people. It lets people who would love to be role players but can't make that weekly commitment for whatever reason. Maybe they're new parents, for example. Um who can't make that commitment, continue to play role-playing games in the narrow slots of time that they have available, which is great for them and great for you because you get to play with those awesome people. And then on top of that, if you're really just, if you love dedicated campaigns like I do, those people that you're playing with can feed back into your dedicated campaigns. So like an example I use is I was running an open table. I know we haven't talked much about what the actual open table is, and we can get into that if we want. But the open table is one where you can get openly invite people, and there's a continued continuity, but you can have different mixes of players. So I had an open table about a decade ago where I had about 60 different players who were active in the open table. They didn't all play on the same night. Obviously, that would be that would be nuts. But they were all playing with each other interchangeably within a continual uh, a, 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 um, a setting that was that was that they all shared together over time, and the great thing about that was, like for example, this 2007 D and D campaign I've been running for 16 years now, which explains why my beard is so gray. Um, <laughs> that campaign, I had a player who moved who moved away, and so had to leave the campaign, and so we had an open seat. Now, that would be, in many campaigns, really tricky to fill because you'd be like, boy, we've been playing together for a decade at this point. Who do we invite into this madness of this campaign? Will they ruin the campaign for us? Well, in our case, many of the players in my dedicated campaign had also been playing in my open table. And so they, so we knew them. We had played with them. And so it was really easy to be like, oh, actually, we know that, um, we know that she will be really good playing with us in a D&D game. So we invited her in, she joined the table, and we continue to all play together, and it's fantastic. And so that's one of the, that's one example. Another example is like, I wanted to run the Eternal Lies campaign for uh, Trail of Cthulhu, which is a fantastic mm-hmm. campaign by um, uh, Jeff Tidball, Will March, and Jeremy Keller. And I, wa- I wanted to run this campaign. And so I had this pool of like 60 different people that I knew loved role-playing games that I had played role-playing games with. And so I was very, I was able to very easily be like, oh, I know exactly who would enjoy playing in this campaign. And so I was able to very quickly find the players I needed to, to run that campaign. And so when you make role-playing games easier and more casual, it can also enhance that dedicated side of the, of the experience. The open table, if I understand it correctly, is, you know, you as the game master sort of set a a night a week or you announce it to the email list and you have a bunch of people. Maybe you have 10 people. Maybe you have eight people. Maybe you have 60 people who can sign up for the game. And, you know, okay, you have some system. The first eight people that say they can come that night can come sort of solves the, the scheduling problem that we all have that it's impossible to always get the seven people in our dedicated games uh, together on that same night and uh, allows people to play at their kind of own pace and convenience and lets you get more games in. That is, that is exactly right. Like you basically just do, you can't just send an email and be like, I'm playing Tuesday. Who wants to show up? And you take the first X number of players you're comfortable running for. And it, and again, just lets everything run really smoothly. There's a chapter in the book talking about my experiences running an open table and also practical advice about how do you manage things like how many players show up? Um, like what, how do you handle a wait list? How do you make sure people get an opportunity to play those kinds of practical practical things talk to, talking about in there. And I, I, I invented the term open table, but this actually goes back, this, this style of play actually goes back to the beginning 
of the hobby. When Dave Arneson was creating Castle Blackmore in his basement in St. Paul, Minnesota, he was creating this mega dungeon setting uh, beneath Castle Blackmore. And it was whichever players could show up on a given night would be the adventurers in the village of Blackmore who would gather together and go down into the mega dungeon. And if you look back actually at early role playing games like the 1974 edition of D&D or the 1977 edition of Traveler, these role playing game manuals will be will say things like okay, you need like you need like a rule book, you need some dice, you need some pads of paper, you need like 20 to 60 players. And you'll be like, hang on. I, I remember as a kid when I was 12 years old, getting into role-playing games for the first time, I came across the 1977 Traveler rule books just in a used game band. I was like, cool. Game about space travel, awesome. So I pick it up, and I'm reading that. I'm like, I, what, 60 players? What are you even talking about? How would that even How would that even work? And it wasn't explained because it was just the assumed mode of play in the early 70s. And it was only it was only over time that the game shifted away from that and into everyone just playing their little, their little isolated, dedicated tables. One more. I want to get to some of the uh, thinking about what you do at the table as a game master. But I have, I have one more thing that I have loved from your blog over the years, which is how you um, approach published adventures, uh, ones that ones that suck, ones that are like kind of cool in certain aspects, ones that are great, and the work that needs to be done. To basically all uh, all three of those, <laughs> what what do we need to do as game masters to make published adventures actually work at the table? The trick that I have found with with published adventures, it actually gets back to some of the things we already talked about, which is that a lot of published adventures are often about that that plotted experience and, and again you'll you'll read them in the adventure where the adventure will be like and then the players do this or the players will likely do this or they'll offer a list of options that the players do and so that that kind of what i think of as contingency based planning is a very limited structure and often a very wordy structure for getting us what we need and so one of the things i will do as i am prepping an adventure or remixing an adventure, publish adventure for me to use at the table, is I will be focused on being like, well, what is the actual structure of play? And another way of thinking about that is how do I actually get, how do I actually take the toys and tools in this adventure and put them into a format and function where I can easily pick them up and play with them so that they're not buried inside a contingency-based text in A, then B, then C text that makes it difficult to like just freely to freely play with them. And so I tend to have a very, again, procedure that I follow when, when doing this. The first thing, I, the first thing, of course, I do is I, I read that adventure. And the, the first thing I'm thinking about as I'm reading in the adventure is, is this an adventure that is worth running? Um, and be because I've often talked about different adventures on my website and like, here's how you can fix this adventure or do this cool thing with this adventure. Sometimes people will, will, will write me or ask me on my Discord, um, you know, oh, this is like the worst adventure that, e that I've ever seen. Can you fix it? And I'll be like, no, why would I want to do that? There's, there's thousands of adventures out there. So even if I didn't want to create my own stuff, which is obviously an option, why would I want to like take the worst thing imaginable? So the first thing is like, is, is there something about the adventure that makes it worth running in the first place? Is there a cool idea? Are there cool themes? Are there cool characters? Like there has to be something there that makes you go, I want to run this beyond I'm I'm sorry that I paid twenty dollars for something that's kind of crap. And like you know, as it goes back to Sturgeon's law about how ninety percent of everything is crap, right? Except he used a stronger word than than crap. And, and that's true. And like, you know, sometimes you have to be like, you know what, that movie wasn't very good. I don't need to do a fan edit of it to try and fix it. I just be like, that's a bad movie. I'm not going to watch it again. And that's fine. That's a good point and a good reminder to me about the sunk cost fallacy, which, uh, you know, when it comes to RPGs is a bit tricky because like if you see a bad movie, you likely didn't pay, you know, you paid for the cost of a ticket and whatever. But if you, you know, if you spent 40 50 60 bucks on a uh, a campaign book you may feel compelled to try to run it but uh it's a good reminder that you don't have to just because you spent money on it like the some sometimes sometimes you just have to sort of just shelve it and and move on and i i i have learned to do it but it is that is another mistake that's easy to make when you just started out 
Well, and I'm, I'm lucky because I, you know, I actually broke into the RPG industry doing reviews. I've been a reviewer of RPG products for a couple of decades now. And so when I get a really bad product, I can still get some entertainment value out of it by like critiquing it. And, and in, in some ways, actually, this is actually, this is good advice for anybody is that if you do read an adventure and you say, Hey, this is crap. And you're, you're a new GM, it can be useful to stop and think, why is it crap? Because analyzing stuff that doesn't work is often the best way to figure out how to make things work. This is such a good point that I that I make in a lot of other contexts, but like uh, there's always something to be learned even from like a bad book, a bad movie, uh, a bad like campaign setting campaign book. Uh, and if, if nothing else, right, it's like what not to do or examining why it doesn't work can be really, really instructive just as reading something that, that does work and is good. Um, and I would actually love your thoughts on like how you how you draw out like what's not we don't have to we have to call anything out specifically. Uh, but yeah, if, if you can help, you know, talk us through like how you decide like what what doesn't work about a, a campaign and and how to identify that. Yeah, so like if we talk about prepping, I think about prepping in terms of like this this prepping which adds more cool stuff. And then this prepping, which is sort of fixing the adventure because there's something wrong with it or something I don't like or something that needs to be adjusted to fit into my campaign. And this really comes back down to structure. We touched on this a little bit earlier, but a lot of game masters and a lot of even RPG designers really only have like two to maybe three structures. Um, a lot of us do do railroading because we understand A to B to C from other mediums. Um, a lot of people know how to do dungeons because D&D used to teach you how to do those. Uh, and then a lot of us also have mysteries, although most people's mysteries, as we kind of touched on earlier, are often really just fragile railroads where like they will find the clue or I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, and so you kind of have like two, maybe two and a half sort of structures that you're trying to make everything work with. And... So oftentimes in published adventures, you'll discover that the adventure is written as a railroad where you have, you have to force the players to do a whole sequence of events. And one of the interesting things I found is that when you see a railroad like that, if you stop and look at it, oftentimes that railroad is not necessary for the adventure to work. So that's one thing is, again, understanding these structures. Like in So You Want to Be a Game Master, we talk about the dungeon structure, we talk about mystery structures, we talk about node-based adventures, we talk about raids and heists and urban crawls and point crawls and hex crawls There's a whole, and more. There's a whole bunch of different scenario structures that the book is designed to show you how to prep and how to use. And once you understand those structures, you can use them to sort of fix these limited or, or broken adventures. Like, here, here's a really simple, this all gets kind of like, what is he even talking about? But here's a really concrete example. You read an adventure, and it is a mystery scenario. And the first thing I do when I'm looking at a mystery scenario is that I will begin listing the conclusions that the players need to make and the clues that point at each one of those conclusions. And then we talked about the three-clue rule earlier. We need to have, for each conclusion you want the players to meet, they should have at least three clues. So I look at those lists and I go, okay, well, here's the conclusion that the adventure wants the players to make. The adventure says, hey, they need to go to the Jade City of Chandra La, for example. And I go, but there's only one clue pointing them to that. So what happens if they miss that clue? Well, they're never going to go to the Jade City. The whole adventure breaks. So the first thing I can do there is say, if it's a mystery, check these conclusions. And if there aren't enough clues, add more clues. And and there you go. You you fix the adventure. It, it, it could be that simple. I know we're talking about like all kinds of like high flute and stuff. But in terms of practical steps, identify what the structure is that you want to use and make sure that structure is actually built correctly. And you're good to go. It seems like a lot of our prep in the like big sense is just we're, we're usually missing uh, connective tissue, right? Because we don't see that in the other media uh, that we have. And a lot of game master adventure and campaign design is adding more connective tissue. I'm curious about uh, the more boots on the ground aspect of game mastering that you talk about in your blog and in your book. Um you know, what, what's your sort of philosophy for uh, how do you construct your dialogue with your players? How do you call for checks? How do you, what is your art, let's say, of rulings? <laughs> well, this is actually one of the first things we talk about in the book, because I, you know, I talked about those first 20 pages where I'm trying to get you to a point where you can run your first adventure. Well, the first adventure I'm trying to teach 
the players how uh, the teach the, the game master how to run is a dungeon adventure and there's a lot of advantages to dungeon adventures for first time game masters because in a in a simple dungeon every room is firewalled from the rest of the adventure like if you're dealing with a conspiracy adventure or that kind of thing you kind of have to think about the entire adventure and how it all impacts things as the players are doing things but in a simple dungeon the PCs go into a dungeon room, and the only thing that really matters is what's in that room. And then when they go to the next room, the only thing that matters is, is what's in that next room. So you have a very much more contained experience, which is easier for a new GM to kind of stay on top of. And even me, I've been GMing for 30 plus years now, and I'm still like, I love dungeons because I can contain the experience. I don't have to think about it so much. It's easy mode, right? So the, there's two things, there's two skills you need to run to run that simple dungeon. And the first one is how do you run a room? How do you read a room key and know how to respond to the player? And the second is how to make um, a ruling. And so one of the, things, the very first things I do in the book is I teach the GM how to make very simple rulings. And then later in the book, we talk about more advanced techniques for making rulings as well, because really in many ways, the core skill of a GM is, as you say, the rulings that we make. When the, when the players say, I wanna do X, how do we respond to that? How do we describe how the world reacts to that? That is the core of a role-playing game, right? And so if we're talking about the very sort of basic core of what a ruling is, I think of it as a very simple sort of hierarchy. And the first thing you should do when you're making a ruling, in my opinion, is to default to yes. So there's a couple of reasons for this. First off, it's, it's super easy. Um, it's not quite the easiest thing. The The easiest thing to say as a DM is no. Is so like, yeah. right, if a player says, I want to jump over the chasm, you say, no, you can't. If they say, I want to attack the orc with my sword, you say, no, you missed. Like, that's super easy. Right. But it's also terrible because when you say no, the narrative doesn't go anywhere, right? Like, I attack the orc. You don't. Okay, well, now what? We don't have any place to go from that. So, so like, you know, so no is a terrible thing to just default to. Don't default to no. Instead, you really want to default to yes. If the players say, I want to jump over the chasm, you say, okay, you did that. Now you're on the other side. If they say, I want to, you know, attack the orc with my sword, you say, okay, um, you kill the orc. And and then that moves th that moves things forward. The players wanted to accomplish something. Now they have. There was probably a reason why they wanted to do that. Um and B, because they wanted to do that, yes is great because they're like, yay, we, we did the thing. So that's great. And that's sort of what you should default to generally. But as I put it in the book, I also like big butts. Let me break that down. <laughs> because in some cases, of course, um, what the players are trying to do either shouldn't work for some reason or... Um, we won't be sure that it works, right? And so default to yes, most of the time when the players say they want to do something, you can be like, yep, that, that you did that, could work. But sometimes you want to you want to say, no, it doesn't quite work for some reason. And what you want to look for, though, is the but. So like, yes, but is a great technique because yes, but says, yes, you do that, but there's a complication. So the players say, I want to jump over the chasm. And you say, okay, you make a big leap, but you don't quite make it. And now you barely grabbed onto the side of the chasm and you need to figure out you know, what to do next. And that's a great technique because that complication that you're adding in the form of the butt is, is now a new challenge, something that, that the players need to respond to and react to in some way that will presumably be interesting. But the other technique you can use too is a no but. So rather, if, if you, for example, if the players say something you know isn't going to work. So for example, if they say like, I'm going to go to the local library and I'm going to like in this little tiny small town and I'm going to like research uh, medieval parademons. And you're like, there's no way that Podunkville's local library has like 14th century codexes, right? But rather than saying, no, you don't find anything, you can think about what, are the, what is the player actually trying to accomplish? In this case, trying to find out information about parademons. And you can say, no, but. So for example, you're like, no, the library here doesn't have one, but the library up in Oxford probably does. And so you can identify for them the path that they need to follow to get to where they want to go. Um, no, this chasm is too large for you to, to cross, but you could try to like build a bridge across it or maybe find a different way of, of climbing across the walls. Help the players identify how they can get to the place that they, they want to go. And then, of course, beyond that... Oh, go ahead. I'm always coming back to this, but I, I think that this is a 
a flaw of D and D or D twenty style games being the default for so many people because so many other game systems have uh, partial successes or successes with consequence, and they have a lot of examples and they teach GMs how to do that. But everything is up, down, succeed, fail in in um, in you know in most D and D D twenty games, and so that's not a, a muscle that gets used for for game masters, but it is learning to say either. Yeah. Learning, learning how to use your big butts is very important, right? Like learning the, the no butts or the yes butts is an incredibly important game master skill. Well, and, and it's interesting, too, because you're really touching on the next step, which is, in fact, when we bring dice into it. Because so far we just talked about just, you know, GM, what we call sometimes GM fiat rulings, where the GM says, yes, that works or no, it doesn't. But yes, but and so you have this sort of core of things where the GM is just saying this makes sense to me. But sometimes you want to be able to use mechanics. And and basically, you bring in those mechanics, obviously. I talk in the book about how you can choose your skills and choose difficulty and all those sort of practical mechanical aspects of that, um, many of which are skills that do apply widely across many different RPGs. Like the numbers may be different, but the actual mental process of how do I figure out how difficult this is, is in fact a, a skill that is transferable, that can be learned, that can be transferred. But then the outcome of that check, like you say, Rob, is is often the same three things. Like the, the outcome of the check is either uh, yes or yes but or no but. And like you say, um, binary systems like D&D tends to default to uh, only produce yes and no answers, which leaves out a whole spectrum of possibilities in the middle. And one of the things you can learn as a GM is, of course, that even when the game system isn't, isn't giving you that spectrum in the middle, that is a muscle that you can use and you can go in there and explore those other uh, those other potential outcomes. Well, with this, I mean, we do have this like a uh, big divide in actual uh, system mechanics between the binary pass fail systems and the ones that are more yes and yes, but no, but yes, no. And this kind of thing. Um, I mean, do you feel like that divide feels smaller when you apply your hierarchy of, of how you're making your rulings and like basically all systems eventually end up in that uh, second category with the ands and buts and yeses and nos, or does system really matter? I think system actually absolutely does matter, but I do think that the gap is, can be closer than, than you think, because like no matter what system you're using, generally speaking, the GM has, has latitude to make the ruling to determine what that outcome actually means. And that can be that can be hard coded in some cases. And and actually that those are the places, the places with the hard coding is where you'll see the difference. So like in D&D for example, the meaning of the outcome of an attack roll in combat is very hard coded into the system. Like if you were running D&D combat, it would be very difficult for someone to roll a successful attack roll but for the GM to be like, ooh, but it only succeeded by like one point. So you're going to not get as good an attack off or there'll be some complication. Because it's so hard coded, it becomes a very difficult place uh, for the DM to practically have, um, to, to, to exit that high structure. And that can also be true in like, uh, D. Vincent Baker's Apocalypse World is the game that really brought a lot of this uh, gradated results into a very formal package and has really popularized that as a system. They obviously existed before that, but like I say, Apocalypse really, really popularized that. But the flip side of that is that one of the ways that Apocalypse World does that, and Powered by the Apocalypse games do that, is by hard coding in the yes and the yes but and the no but. And so in the same way, you also, by hard coding those in, the, the GM does have less power to make a flexible ruling based on what feels appropriate for the moment without violating the table convention of following those those hard coded results, if that kind of makes sense. Now, Apocalypse World does a great job of balancing that out because the hard coded results are often, you know, the GM should make a decision. And so the creativity is baked into the hard-coded structure there. Um, so there, there's a balancing act there as well. But I, to get back to what you're saying about, like, is, do those come closer together? I think absolutely, because the ways in which many of these techniques, the yes, but, the margins of successes, the, um, uh, 
the the uh, fail forward techniques where you roll a mechanical failure, but you interpret that as still succeeding at what you wanted to do, but there's a complication on top of it. All of those techniques were developed by GMs using binary output systems and finding different ways of flavoring and gradating those. And only over time did those then become formalized into the systems. So the, for the formality of finding those in the game systems is not a requirement, although it is a great way to, to learn those skills, is to run a game like Apocalypse World or Magical Kitty Save the Day where those values are baked in because then you're forced to engage those muscles and learn what those muscles feel like. What else, I guess, big picture question, uh, Justin, is is in this book that I think is is for experienced DMs that I think a lot of our listeners are. People who have dungeon mastered for a year or five and are like, uh, yeah, because uh, it, uh, I mean, is amazing. Like when you look for books on game mastering, right, you end up finding like, uh, Dungeons and Dragons for Dummies or whatever is usually the first thing that comes up, which is not like the worst book in the world, but maybe doesn't have a lot of it, uh, advice for uh, experienced dungeon masters and game masters. Yeah, so a, a, a lot of the book is going to come back to the fact that even experienced game masters are often just using, like I say, potted adventures, dungeons, and mysteries. And this book will certainly teach you how to do those things. It'll also, in each ta case, take you to another level. So, like, over the first hundred pages of the book, roughly speaking, you will learn how to run a basic dungeon, and there's a basic dungeon adventure. And the sort of experienced game master you're talking about will probably not find a lot new there. Hopefully they like the adventure, and there is like a new, what I refer to as an adventure recipe called the 5 plus 5 dungeon, which is a very simple... Uh, recipe structure for creating a cool dungeon adventure. So like there's the scenario structure is how dungeons work, and then there are these adventure recipes that are like a tried and proven formula for making a dungeon. You can pour content into a recipe and it will work. So that's something they, may, they, they will not have seen that before because I created the 5 plus 5 dungeon and hadn't published it previously to the book. So that, there's little nuggets in there. But for the most part, if you're an experienced GM, you probably know how dungeons work. And so you will not find a whole lot new there. Although I say that, but even that's not true because most people running dungeons today don't have a formal dungeon procedure um, because D&D &D no longer teaches formal dungeon procedures. Um, and so that's also in there. But then after, anyways, assuming you know everything about dungeons, you know, first 90 pages of the book is that sort of basic dungeon stuff. And you'll be going, okay, but I know how to run a dungeon. And I'll be like, yeah, we all do. It's great. But then I go into like advanced dungeons and dynamic dungeons and I start talking about techniques like adversary rosters for bringing dungeons to life, how do mega dungeons work and the unique structures of how mega dungeons work, what do nonlinear dungeon design look like, and so there's a lot of advanced techniques there. And so there's another like oh, 50, 60 pages of material there. And even then, okay, some of your listeners are like, okay, but like I've, I've run dungeons before. And I'm like, okay, great. There's still 500 more pages to the book. And that's when we're going to get into, okay, well, here's, here's how mysteries work. And we talked about like the three clue rule, but then we also go, okay, well, the next step beyond the three clue rule is the node-based scenario design that you were talking about, Matt. And we're going to talk about some of the advanced techniques for running that kind of thing. And also, here is an adventure recipe for running mysteries. And here is a, another adventure recipe for running mysteries. And here is a campaign recipe for putting together a whole campaign uh, linked together of multiple mystery scenarios. And then, okay, great. We all know our mysteries. That's great. Now we're going to go into how does a raid work? And here are specific structures for how a raid works and specific tools for improvising content when you're running a raid scenario in response to the player's actions during a raid scenario. Okay, raids are great. Let's raise that up and make a more advanced raid, which we often call a heist and all the advanced techniques that involved in running a heist. Okay, and now we're going to move on to how do you run urban adventures, not just adventures that happen in a city, but adventures that are structured around the city. How do you actually run a city in practice? How do you handle a robust system of downtime? How do you handle uh, multiple factions in a setting and how do they interact with downtime? Here is how you run an urban crawl where the adventure, much like in the same way that you crawl through a dungeon or you crawl through the wilderness, what does it mean to crawl through a city? And here's a specific scenario structure that dives into that. Here's how you can run large social events and prep large social 
special events and then use that prep at the table um, where you're dealing with, you know, how do I run 15 or 20 NPCs at a big social event and not just lose my mind trying to manage that? Here's a specific structure for doing that. Okay, great. So now we've done dungeons, we've done mysteries, we've done raids, we've done heists, we've done cities. Let's leave the city and go out into the wilderness. And here's, you know, here's how you can handle travel in the wilderness and the structure for prepping that travel in a way that will be interesting for the players. Okay, now they want to get off the road and they want to go actually exploring. Okay, well, here's how you run a hex crawl. Okay, now you've run hex crawls. Maybe in a situation where you want to have a little bit of exploration flexibility, but you don't need to like prep an entire hex crawl full of content. Hey, look, here are point crawls. And at this point, we're about 400 pages into the book. And we've dealt with a lot of scenario structures and advanced techniques and tools that I think a lot of GMs, if you've read The Alexandrian, uh, I think you'll, you'll find a lot familiar there, but there's also going to be a lot of new material, as I kind of alluded to there, that that hasn't been published before. And even so that's been on the Alexandrian, hasn't been unified into a single cohesive vision and procedure for you to follow. Now, at this point, there's still another uh, about 120 pages left in the book. And that's when we kind of transition into what I refer to as the extra credit section of the book. And the idea behind, I should also mention too, like the whole book is designed, so you have this opening section where you learn how to run a basic dungeon. And then the book says, okay, great. First, you, you run your first adventure. It's great. You learn how to run dungeons. Now, at this point, you can keep reading the book cover to cover if you want, but you don't have to. Here, you, you can go, if you want to run a mystery, jump to the mystery section, jump to the Raisin Heist section, jump to the Wilderness section. What adventure do you want to try and run next? Go to that section. It will teach you how to do that. The extra credit section is about stuff that you can really use in almost any campaign. And so there's a whole chapter in there talking about how you can create your campaign, how you can recruit your players, how you can prep the initial briefing packet for the players. Um, there's a section in there called Quick and Dirty World Building, which is all about you want to create your, your own setting, but you look at something like the Forgotten Realms or Star Wars or Middle Earth, and you think, oh, I don't really want to spend the next five years of my life designing the setting, though. And I'd be like, you don't have to. You, can, you, you have a game on Saturday. We can get you a completely new original setting by Saturday. What is the essential stuff that you need to prep for that? There's a whole section on campaign status documents, which is a whole way of organizing a campaign and keeping things in, in keeping keeping track of things over the course of multiple adventures. There's a chapter on learning a new RPG. If someone here has only played D and D, for example, or they just want to learn something new, how do you do that? What is the actual like tips and tricks for doing that? There's a whole chapter on the open table that we talked about earlier. There's a chapter on rumor tables, running combat, scenario hooks, how to run your supporting cast and create your supporting cast of NPCs. And last but not least, um, splitting the party. How do you actually handle what happens when the players say, hey, I want to go do three different things at once? Um, and why is it actually the coolest thing that your players can do for you? Because This I is, often this is how you know that, that Justin is a better GM than me, because this is when <laughs> I say no. I, I, I almost always say, <laughs> I always say, don't do that. You, you shouldn't do that. So uh, I'm actually really interested to read this part because uh, it is one of the more challenging things you're likely to encounter. And I'm, I'm very interested in your, um, your advice on it. Um, I want, I realize I appreciate the rundown because I realize we spent the whole time just gabbing uh, and I, yeah. I, I, I could do that for another like two hours, but I did want to bring some stuff up about the book itself. Uh, and specifically it's coming out soon. And it's published by Macmillan, it looks like. So if our listeners wanted to pre-order it, is there a place where that's most useful to you? Like pre-ordering it on, on Amazon or, or Barnes & Noble or from like an indie thing? Like is is there a way that's... I, I know from uh, my other friends and, and people I follow who are... Uh, who are authors that, that pre-orders make a big difference. So where, if anywhere, should they pre-order from if they're interested in this book? Yeah, so what I, what I tell people is, so the great thing about this book is that it is actually being published by Macmillan. So it's going to go into mainstream book distribution. So any place that you find your favorite your favorite authors, your favorite books, it's going to be available through there. So I tell people, look, actually, one of the best places you could go to pre-order would be your local bookstore. It's it's good for your local bookstore. Um, it also will help spread the word about the book to more bookstores. But the, the second best place is pretty much whatever's easiest for you. It makes actually very little difference to me as the author where you buy the book in terms of like what I'm getting from that. So the most important thing is that you get the book from the place that's easiest for you to get it from, which can include Amazon, Barnes & Noble, your local bookstore. Um, 
we're, we're hoping we'll be able to get the book into hobby distribution as well. Um, and so you should be able to order it from your local game store as well, if all goes well. Oh, yeah. um, that might be, depending on when, when this actually airs, that may not actually be in the catalog yet for hobby distribution. Um, because Macmillan hasn't really done that, but they're taking the opportunity to try and make that happen for this book. Um, but like I say, any place you can or, you know pre-order Stephen King or George R. R. Martin or um, uh, N.K. Jemisin, any of those types of authors you can pre-order the book there as well. And, and you should. I'm biased, but I, I think you should. As an author promoting my book, I appreciate making sure we get that in. I, I, I'm, try, I'm trying to look out for you, Justin. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I, listen, I listen to a lot of podcasts, and this part comes up at the end, so I wanted to make sure that we were doing our due diligence as hosts to you as a guest and make sure that we at least prompted you to uh, to talk about pre-orders. But yeah, Matt, sorry, go ahead. What else have you got? Well, I have a little dessert topic for us if we <laughs> choose to engage it, right? I'm not prepping well, a plot. Uh, this is uh, just the situation. I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, so I, as I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, I found your blog when I just, you know, bought fourth edition, I played it and I was feeling dissatisfied. I couldn't understand why. And I probably Googled like fourth edition feels bad. Like why? And I like <laughs> somehow it led me to one of your articles. One of the things that I love that seems to be happening right now as a new edition of uh, revi revisions to Pathfinder, second edition are happening, a uh, new edition of Starfinder is coming out, and of course a new edition of uh, 5e Dungeons & Dragons by WotC is a lot of fans seem to be uh, backing themselves into a uh, fourth edition design maybe unconsciously they're like well shouldn't uh shouldn't the uh fighter and the rogue have uh spell like powers uh shouldn't we do this and uh i, I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on the like retrospective of fourth edition because i think like both rob and i have in, in the past you know 15 years discovered things about fourth edition that we like uh certain things in the dungeon master's guide that were hey this was actually good advice uh, i really liked how monsters had classifications um and i i feel like we've we've uh, done a forgetting for some of the things <laughs> that really uh made fourth edition not as successful I don't know. Did you notice this going on too, Justin? In yeah, the absolutely. I, I, there's a number. There's a number of factors, and one of them is the fact that like fourth edition came out in 2008, and so that's 15 years ago, and that's the perfect nostalgia window. If somebody was playing D and D fourth edition as their first edition of D and D in in 2008 as a 15 year old, well, they're hitting their 30s now, and that's that's the nostalgia window, right? <laughs> we all hit 30. And we're like, what were we doing when we were 12? It was so lovely, wasn't it? Um, so that's one of the reasons why I think you're seeing it come back, is that it's hitting the nostalgia window. But like you say, there's a lot of really great things about 4th edition. I sometimes do get the rep as like the guy who hated 4th edition because I wrote it. I wrote an essay called um, Dissociated Mechanics that talked about some of these core things that people were responding to and being like, I don't know why I don't like this, but it's not working for me. Um, and there was a lot of discussions in 2008 on internet forums and so forth talking about why isn't this working? And I was having the same discussions. I was like, I, there's just something here that doesn't quite feel right to me. And the dissociated mechanics essay was the result of that. And so dissociated mechanics basically refers to this principle that, um, I guess we can come from the, from the opposite direction, which is that one of the things that makes a role-playing game a role-playing game is that the mechanics are associated in the sense that the mechanical decisions you are making as a player are directly associated to the mechanical decisions that your character is making in the game world. And that doesn't mean that the the character is aware of the mechanics. Mechanics are metagamed and they are abstracted. So like, for example, if you cast a fireball spell as a wizard, um, you mechanically as the player are aware that you are casting a third level spell that deals 5d6 points of damage. And the wizard, your character, doesn't know that a fireball does 5d6 points of damage because they don't obviously know about dice. But your decision to cast that fireball spell is directly associated to the character's decision to cast a fireball spell. And that's different from a game like, say, Monopoly, where your decisions about moving around the board and, and so forth are not really directly associated to any particular character in the setting. Um, or like the way that in, 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 in the board game Clue, for example, uh, you, you move around the board by rolling dice and then you go to a room and when you're in a room, you can like 
make a guess about what cards are in a little, little sheath. Mm-hmm. Well, that none of that decision-making process mechanically is associated to the decisions that a character is making. Dissociated mechanics are when you as a player are making mechanical choices that are not associated to your character's decisions. And a really easy example of this in a mechanic that can nevertheless be very useful in role-playing games is like a luck point or a fate point or even say like spending an inspiration point in 5th edition because your character doesn't know that luck points exist. Your character is not choosing to use a luck point. Your character's not choosing to use inspiration to gain advantage on a die roll. Um, the, so the mechanical decision that you're making is dissociated from the character from the decision that your character is making. And and that's not always a bad thing. That's not always a bad thing. There's lots of ways in which that can be to the benefit. But the problem that many players have with those mechanics is that it feels like it distances them from the role-playing experience because suddenly they're making all these decisions that aren't role-playing decisions, that aren't decisions being made as if they were their character. And that's the thing I think most people, when it came to fourth edition, were reacting to, is that the designer said, wouldn't it be cool if fighters could cast spell-like abilities like wizards? But they didn't give fighters in the game world access to spell-like abilities. They gave the players access to abilities that they could only use once per combat for no associated reason. And the logic that often comes back is, oh, well, that represents like a a lucky circumstance during play where things lined up. And so for that one time, the, the fighter could like, you know, make a whirlwind attack and coincidentally hit three people at the same time. You can't do that every round because that lucky circumstance hasn't come up. But the dissociated aspect of it is the fact that it's not that in the game world something lucky showed up and you took advantage of that to hit three people. It's that you as the player decided that that moment was going to happen. That's that's the decision that is, again, dissociated from your character. And that's the thing people react to. It's, and I, uh, I think there's legitimacy to it. Cause like, what is it? What is a role playing game? If you're not actually making character decisions, instead of adding powers to classes that, uh, don't, don't have them to make them more interesting, which is I think where people start, uh, people tend to end up at with, what if we made all powers more board game, like, or something mm-hmm. like that at uh, dissociated, as you said, um, it, yeah, I, I don't know. Do you think I, it seems like uh, the decisions at uh, WotC and uh, Cobalt Press and everyone who is making a fifth edition or a D&D like game are not getting there. But I was just amused to see fans have this desire to return to a system that, you know, um, at least according to the best data we have, not that many people play anymore. There's not a lot of people on Roll20, for example, playing fourth edition right now um what is what do you think is is out there why do people kind of want something of you said it's nostalgia but i i I sort of have the inkling that there is something else to it there there is also there is also a reaction to the fact that D &D is fundamentally built or this could get real grog naughty this could get real geeky (laughs) So D- D&D, yeah. the deep geek is where we're heading. But so d d is fundamentally built around expedition-based play. And so d d is, is fun, all, all the way back in 1972 as Dave Arneson's running his first Castle Blackmore games before d d even exists yet. It's based around this expedition-based play. And what I mean by that is that uh, you would, as a, as a group of PCs, you would gather a set of resources and you would go into danger, either into a giant dungeon or out into the wilderness. And you would go on an expedition and you would attempt to maximize the results from your expedition. You would spend resources in the most efficient way possible to maximize your output. The simplest version being to maximize the amount of gold that you brought back home with you. And some, some of the some of the expedition's resource management was literally things that, like the equipment that you bought, the supplies that you brought with you. And some of it is mechanical, the, the number of spells that the wizard has, the number of hit points that you have, the amount of healing that you have. And, and when you begin running out of those, out of the supplies that you've put together for the expedition, when you've hopefully maximized the returns on the expedition, you return home. And that, that style of play is interesting because it creates uh, strategic choices, and it motivates you to make strong strategic choices 
because you want to maximize the results of the resources that you're spending. And this is baked pretty deep in the game's DNA. It's why it's why spellcasters are limited by the number of spells that they can cast per day, because those become... Really, it's more about the number of spells that you can cast per expedition. And so you have a limited number of spells, and you want to use those spells in the most efficient way possible. So you don't necessarily, in expedition-based play, want to go in and just nova all of your best abilities... Uh, right away because that's not the most efficient way that's not going to maximize your payoff from that expedition the problem that dnd has today is a bit of an identity crisis because the game has moved away from that expedition style of play and so you no longer have the strategic concerns of maximizing the efficiency of those payoffs and so then the balance between the classes begins to break down. And it particularly breaks down, in my experience, with linear pre-plotted adventures. And one of the reasons why it breaks down so severely in those types of adventures is that when you as the game master have it, when you're prepping a linear adventure, you, another way of thinking about that is that you are forcing the players to do A, then you are forcing them to do B, then you are forcing them to do C. And when you are forcing the players to do that specific sequence of events, well, A, strategic play goes out the window, right? Like, there's no strategic decisions for the player. There's tactical decisions, potentially. Like, if they fight somebody at B, they can make tactical decisions about that fight, but they can't make any strategic decisions about, you know, do we not do, we not do B? Do we do something else instead? So those strategic decisions vanish. And without those strategic decisions, a couple things happen. First off, so the expedition play goes out the window. But more importantly, when you are forcing the players to do those things in a specific order often, then all the responsibility for the game is on you as the game master. If you're going to force the players to do B, for example, to fight the orcs at B, then you better make sure that that orc fight is A, completely balanced. Because if it's not, and you force them to do it anyways, you're, you're killing them, right? Like, if, if you're in a mega dungeon and there's some orcs on level 3 that are too dangerous to fight, the players can just not fight them. They can go and level up someplace else. They can do something else. Um, and so that's a shared responsibility for the difficulty of that encounter. But if you as the GM are forcing them to fight those orcs, then you are responsible. So you better make sure the balance in that encounter is laser tight. Also, man, if you're forcing the group to do A, B, and C, then you better make sure that you've got five players that all five of those players have things that they're going to do at A, B, and C. Because if you're like, oh, I designed this adventure, but I forgot to include anything for Sheila to do, that's kind of a jerk move. Like, Sheila would like to play too. So all this responsibility comes and lays on the GM's, on the GM's shoulders. Uh, I'm off on a tangent now. No, I'm no, rant, no. And I, I apologize mean, for I mean, that. No, but you're, 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 I mean, this is <laughs> something that we talk about all the time, and... I know you know this, but like I, I think part of the the struggle with five E and with the with the new edition, whatever they're going to call it, and the 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 yearning for fourth edition is that people are discovering or rediscovering that like as Dungeons and Dragons tries to be all things to all people, that the the framework uh, breaks down, and like the only time that you are ever going to feel sorry, this is this is my experience. The only time your mm -hmm. your party is going to feel like everybody is working together, everything is balanced is when they're doing that expedition style play when they're in like a mega dungeon right that's the only time you're going to find four to eight you know encounters of like differing sizes and they're going to get everyone's going to use all of their resources per long rest if you're trying to run like a linear plot you are going to try to throw one or two encounters at them a day because nothing else like mm -hmm. makes sense uh unless you're rolling on a random encounter table which everybody hates and uh, feels silly most of the time uh and i don't i don't have a solution for this but like i it, to me this all feels like sort of like the the framework of the system straining against like what it is trying to be well what it comes back to is like i say all this responsibility lays on the on the gm shoulders in these linear games to bring this all the way back to what we were talking about at the beginning at the beginning of the episode is that when you are getting into a mode where you're prepping situations and you are actively playing with the players, then the players are empowered to make these strategic decisions. And then suddenly that weight comes off of your shoulders. You don't need to have every encounter be perfectly balanced because maybe they don't have to fight that encounter or they can find some other way of working around that encounter. And more importantly, like you don't have to worry is, 
Did I include something for Sheila in my list of specific things that they need to do? I don't have to worry about that because Sheila will propose actions that she wants to do. And because I haven't predetermined which actions we're going to do, we can just follow Sheila's lead. And the players will, generally speaking, um, propose things that they want to do and, and involve themselves. Um, you know, I'll give the caveat that some players may be shy or new or whatever, and you want to reach out and engage those players and pull them in. But even that's easier when you're just trying to engage them um, actively rather than trying to like force an engagement on them. So like all that's uh, so once that weight comes off and once the players are making those strategic decisions, you also begin losing some of this pressure to have these perfectly. I call them like my precious encounters, where you have to design these little precious little encounters that work all by themselves. And that is where fourth edition's design methodology came from. Was we're going to have to have these precious little encounters, and this encounter needs to be a perfect experience all by itself because we're gonna we're gonna force it to happen. And it's going to, in the case of 4th edition, shoot up a big chunk of our session because combat took a long time in 4th edition. Oh, God, yes. And when you have that mentality, you have to put a lot of effort into making it perfect. And that's where a lot of the 4th editionisms that you see come out of is trying to make these little perfect encounters where everybody in every encounter um, has a predetermined role that they get to play. And there are advantages to having those like labels about different types of creatures and how you can build these encounters in interesting ways. I'm not saying that there isn't, but d the fundamental sort of DNA of DND D as a game was not designed for these linear pre-plotted railroads. It was designed for open free form strategic based play where the players were making interesting decisions about how and when and where to use their resources. And you know, going into the mega dungeon, going out into the wilderness is one way of having those big, meaningful strategic decisions. There are other ways of having those strategic decisions. They will emerge naturally, in my experience, from any situation in which you are actively playing with the players and letting the players actively play with you rather than trying to force them through uh, through a predetermined sequence of events. Awesome stuff. Thank you for indulging me in <laughs> our side tangent back to 2008 and 2009. Um, and, you know, uh, in conclusion, that's why 5th uh, edition Dungeons & Dragons is the perfect system to play a Star Wars campaign. I think that's where we landed. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, no, no, no. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, thanks again for coming on the show, uh, Justin. It, it's great to have you back and to be talking about a more happy topic. I really am looking forward to the book. Thank you so much. I am also looking forward to the book. I hope you yeah. enjoy it as much as I do. I, I'm sure you've been working on it a long time, and you're probably very excited to see it out in the world. So we're, we cannot wait to get our hands on it and review it, and uh, hopefully we'll have you on again sometime soon. Love chatting with you. Listeners, yeah, we'll, we'll include links for you to pre-order and to all of Justin's good stuff. Thank you all for listening, and keep rolling them dice. Change your life, take a chance, you need the wrong or right. You never know if you will roll them dice. You better roll them dice. You never know if it'll change your life. One, take a chance, you need the wrong or right.